I have a title and we are, we're pretty much live. We're live now. So hello everybody. I'm just checking on my phone to make sure you guys can find us on the, um, on the, there we are. There we are. That's good. All right. So, hey, it is Thursday, the 14th of July, and we are doing our third Dulce Moon Talk. I'm DJ Homoris, one of the co-producers, and with me is the delightful Tina Bergman. How are you doing this morning, hon? I'm doing fantastic. It's a gorgeous day here in Northeast Ohio. All right, Ohio. Well, I'm in Albany, California, so we are literally coast to coast, pretty much. Um, so Tina was uh, sweet enough to agree a year and a half ahead <laughs> to yeah. be our featured teaching artist uh, on Hammer Dulcimer. And um, you've done some uh, festivals already this year in person, right? Yeah. 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 And, and um, did you meet some fun people? I did. It was really lovely. I spent some time in Texas at Dana Hamilton's festival, the Glen Rose Festival, mm. and uh, got to play with the Vandeveer brothers. And I just love that family. Just love them to <laughs> pieces. And they actually have roots here in, in this part of Ohio, just a couple of towns over. So it was wonderful. I've, I've gotten to see them a few times over the years, but it was great to see them on their home turf and at their home festival. And um, so that was lovely. Uh, you know, played a lot of fantastic music there. Um, was in um, Kentucky, had a great time there as well. Did some nice jamming and uh, some good concerts and lots of good teaching. That's great. That's great. Yeah, those big festivals especially are sweet. And uh, I know there's another one in Texas called Old Palestine. I'd love, to, I'd love to go there sometime. I met Margaret Wright at the Lignat Festival, and her family is quite the musical family as well. They were there at Glen Rose as well. And all of the generations, all the little kids, like the Pied Piper, they all come up on stage and sing and it's fantastic oh that's sweet that's yeah. sweet um i teach at the freight and salvage in berkeley and um i've been to some of the old time jams there and i tell you the the ones you got to look out for are the kids under 10 that play fiddle oh man they're amazing they are amazing the generation it, it, we are we are secure in berkeley <laughs> among our all-time fiddle players we really yeah. love that that's great that's so we like to talk about well dulce moon festival is um it's a woman-led festival but it's everybody's welcome to come it's just that we're focusing on the women where we like to say we're shining a light on the women in the dulcimer community and um i just wondered if you had any particular um mentors or teachers in the community uh, present or past that you would like to uh, shine a light on here for yourself? Sure, just a little bit of a backstory. I started playing hammer dulcimer. I first started on mountain dulcimer when I was seven or eight. And then um, when I found the mountain or the hammer dulcimer, I began playing that. And growing up, I, I was pretty much self taught the whole way. Um, I was not finding it was mostly growing up in this male dominated world of hammer dulcimer players and it wasn't until i was in college and i was booking the kent state folk festival which at the time was the longest student-run folk festival in the nation pretty incredible event uh, and i decided to book karen ashbrook to come and that was really so wonderful for me to meet Karen in person. Of course, I'd listened to her music for years. And she was so beautifully, beautifully supportive of what I was doing, even though it was a completely different style than her beautiful style. And that wasn't always the case growing up. Um, it seemed like not so much with female mentors, of course, because I just wasn't running into them as much. But um th there was oftentimes competition and sort of like trying to cut you down to raise other people up and um that's one thing that i have not experienced i'm sure you know music is a microcosm of of the world you know it's not to say that these people aren't out there but i have have yet to find those people in the female dulcimer community 
to raise others up through cutting people down. Mm -hmm. um, and so I treasure that, and especially growing up in such a male dominated world of music. So Karen Ashbrook was just such a, a lovely, um, talented, generous um, person who, um, who I could look to and admire her music, although it was very different from what I was doing and her level of professionalism and her finesse, um, her style, all of it. She, it was really wonderful. And I still think the world of her today. She's just a tremendous musician, for sure. The first time I came across her name was in the Dulcimer Players News because before COVID, I didn't know any of these people. Really, I'm just West Coast teacher, West Coast event that I produce and uh, wherever I managed to go, which wasn't far, although I did go to Bing Fetch's first uh, Key West, Florida Dulcimer Festival. I think he had two or three and I went to the first one. That was quite the initiation <laughs> in 2010. Well, it's like, you know, yeah, everybody was there anyway. Um, it was great to read the article that Ashley Ernst had written about Karen and her work with the uh, in the medical field. Yes, the veterans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's really wonderful to to see her um, sort of the evolution of of how she's using her music in in her life and then also in others' lives um, for healing and you know, lifting, and I, I think it's just incredible. And again, it's it's a wonderful um, example to um, to study and enjoy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I always love watching her perform. I know, <laughs> <laughs> so adorable. The way she'll like hop, she'll she has a little hop that she does that just makes me laugh out loud. I just love it. Put it in a bottle and then put some behind my ears. I know. <laughs> Although I love watching you and um, Brian perform too, you guys really are in sync with each other and uh, you're clearly loving what you're performing. Um, it's Thank that's you. definitely fun to see. It's inspiring for me performing with my husband um, because we try to make sure that each of us is satisfied, but it's only music that we love that we really feel mm -hmm. so that we can put that feeling into the music, right? That's what everybody wants. Yeah, it really is. It's interesting too, because Brian's background is um, classical. He's classically trained, but then jazz, Puerto Rican music, Cuban music, African music, like he's played so many different styles of music. And so sometimes the things that he like lays upon my desk, I'm like, oh, are you kidding? This, this seems very difficult and crazy and oh, I can't do it. And then it's my favorite. It's just my absolute favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to become a better improviser. And so a lot of this stuff, you know, you have to improvise like E flat major. Oh, great. That's fantastic. You know, my, <laughs> my and I'm like, so yeah, it's kind of funny, but I love it. I, I, and I always have to remember that he, um, he had a gig where it was a weekly gig and he's called it his yes gig that one day they asked him to sing and he's like, I'm not a singer. And so he just said, yes. And so whatever they would ask him to do, he said, yes. And so I thought that is a wonderful way to live your musical life is just instead of being a little fearful and saying, well, I don't think so. That's not my wheelhouse saying, <laughs> yes, I'll do yes. that. Yeah. So that. talking about playing E flat major on your, on your hammer dulcimer, how, I mean, so my big question is mountain dulcimer is diatonic. We don't have all the notes, right? Right. We have big frets, which are whole steps and short frets, which are half steps. I just explained all this to my, intro class last night and and even saying the word diatonic i can see people's eyes going ooh, right. music theory ooh. <laughs> yeah. so my question to you is our hammer dulcimers chromatic yes and no and yes that's uh, what i thought <laughs> right so right. they are diatonic instruments in that um they are laid out diatonically so if i go from so i have two bridges the left side bridge is my treble bridge the right side is my bass bridge so it's the opposite of the piano 
You know, okay. you normally have the left hand playing the lower mm -hmm. uh, material and then the right hand, the higher, but it's the opposite. So the right is the bass bridge, left is the treble. Um, once the string crosses the treble bridge, it goes up a fifth. So it's do and so, do, so, do, so. I can't find it this morning. <laughs> It's in there somewhere, but so to play uh, to play a key, we have those beautiful mark courses mm -hmm. that um, Sam Rosetta was responsible for getting on the instruments. Otherwise, it was just a bridge with a mess of strings, and those it's every fourth one. So from the top, it's F C G D A, and some folks have another key. They have E at the bottom. So each one of those sets of fours, they it's known as a box key in the hammer dulcimer world. And so it's just a tetrachord. So for example, C, D, E, F, and then across the bridge, G, A, B, C. So you just have this neat little box. So, and it adds sharps as you go down. So we have C, then the key of G with one sharp, D with two sharps, A with three sharps. And if you have a larger dulcimer, E with four sharps. And then on the bass bridge, we have our one tr flat key that's easily laid out. We have F major and then starts over with C and that's middle C on the bass bridge, middle C and then G and then D. And folks with the larger dulcimer now have the key of B flat above F, which is um, interesting. It would make my life a little easier in some ways. I'd be playing this crazy stuff with Brian. But so, and to play a chromatic scale, so each one of those is a, you know, is a diatonic scale, but to play a chromatic scale, you're, you're moving in these diagonal and hitching ways across the instrument. So for example, B, C on the bass bridge, then coming over to the treble bridge, C sharp, D, and coming over to the left side of the treble bridge, D sharp, E. Back to the brace bridge, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, B flat, B, C, D, C sharp, D. So it moves in this terrible inconvenient way so you can play chromatically on it but it's not friendly and they do okay. have chromatic they have what they call piano hammer dulcimers but i have yet to meet someone even pianists who can feel comfortable playing those it's a whole nother ball of wax I think. so it kind of looks like a chevron yeah. sort of pattern like a downward chevron pattern each time that you you gestured that's what i was seeing so that's one of the things that really helps me with the mountain dulcimer is patterns yes physical patterns yes. Or, that you can uh, recreate and that have some um familiarity you know like the l shape and you know chords and the bar chords and the triangle shape and the slant and the extended slant all of that that we teach our our students and and that we use in our playing mm -hmm. um do you find that these these patterns you you end up doing um so that was the c scale right that you mm -hmm. described yes yeah well the chromatic scale is the one with the, the chromatic one right? right so all 12. Mm -hmm. so do you find are you in most musical th instruments you practice your scales right do you do that uh, yeah, and in fact, on the hammer dulcimer there, because we, unlike a piano, and more like a violin or a guitar or a mountain dulcimer, you know, you can keep moving up one string, but at some point you could go down to the next open string, right? Right. Um, and to keep it more compact. Mm -hmm. um, but with the, with the hammer dulcimer, we have the same thing. Um, we have repeated notes. And then um, if you can't go straight up the bridge because you're going to hit a natural where you need a sharp, uh, but you can uh, do that four plus four shape I was, you know, showing e earlier, you can do a five plus three or a six plus two. So you can, pardon me, you can combine all of these different scale shapes, which is very convenient since we're talking about what hand is available. So if we're walking up, we can go one further generally so the right hand can play and the left hand can be free to cross so we're not bringing both hands over it's a little bit less cumbersome yeah i have a question for you sure are the are the patterns that you're discussing on the mountain dulcimer and you had names for them the slant the extended slant the triangle you know are those patterns described with those words fairly uniformly or does each teacher have their own sort of little take on how they describe it well 
you know, I've been playing for 43 years and for the first 25 years in isolation. So um, <laughs> that's part of the, the thing with the mountain dulcimer world is the, the innovations that have happened with tablet edit and, um, and, and the internet and uh, the festivals, people going, you know, to different festivals, then there's a lot more cross cross fertilization of yeah. knowledge and understanding and also some codification. Mm -hmm. Like um, if you look at tablature, I have these beautiful hand calligraphed tablature books from Carrie Crompton of early medieval and Renaissance tunes, you know, and um, and it's and Joellen Lapidus's book, which came out in the 70s um, or early 80s, no, 70s, definitely. Um, her tablature was completely hers. Wow. She, she, it wasn't a thing you typeset at all. And so um, when you talk about how much do we all talk about it, in the last 10 years, I would say that most of the teachers I've come across either when I've taken a class or when I've been teaching classes, we do talk about the shapes, the chord shapes on the mountain dulcimer pretty universally. Mm -hmm. As I said, the bar is straight across all three at each fret. And the, and the great thing about that is that, um, is that we are able to, uh, name the chords by the name of the note on the outside frets because those two strings are always tuned to the same note ah. so whether you're tuned dad or cgc you if you know the scale you know what chord that bar chord is and because you don't have the third you only have the the tonic and the fifth it's major or minor oh nice these are your cheat chords <laughs> Yeah, nice. Right. And then um, the G bar chord would be at the third fret if you're tuned to DAD. And some people use pinky, ring, and middle finger on that, leaving these fingers free to do something else. Um, so that would be 333. Three, three. But if you do 335, three, that gives you the third, and that's G major. Hmm. So third fret, third fret, and five. And that is the L shape. It's hard to see on my hand, but if you think of a fretboard, right. it goes three, three, five. And that L shape yeah. is consistent all the way up the fretboard. And on that one, your what fingers on the bass string is the name of the chord. I like see. that. And that so there's a whole system to it. And then the um slant is if you go three, four, five. Well, that's an E minor mm -hmm. and um, that middle string, that's your E, mm -hmm. right? I think, yeah, <laughs> brain. Anyway, um, so they're just one fret apart and that's your slant and your extended slant is when that top note is yet one more fret up mm -hmm. on, the, on the melody string. And to confuse things even more, you can flip those. And instead of having bass, middle, melody, you can have bass. Uh, you can have um, a yeah, bass middle melody. You can flip it and have the bass note up um, nice. a third. So, um, and people do talk about bar, L shape, slant, extended slant, but there's also a, a, another one, which is a triangle where you're, um, like the A chord, uh, that's easiest is 101 when you're in DAD. That's mm -hmm. E A E. It's as if mm -hmm. your your middle finger is down just below the nut. And you can think of that mm -hmm. as a, tri a triangle and you can go up with that chord as well. Sometimes that mm -hmm. works well with the melody that you're working with. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just that your fingers are getting tied up and it's easier to just do two frets. <laughs> Two fingers right. on the same fret and one finger on the fret below and mm -hmm. to get your chord. So there is a whole system there. I learned that system from Larry Conger. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. But um, I've seen it. I just did a week at Dulcimer Week in the Wallawas with uh, Susan Trump. And in the advanced class, she started us there mm -hmm. and, and spelled out how you can tell by looking at what you're playing, if you know your scale, on each string, which not mm -hmm. all players do, right? right? 
right, right? Yeah. um if you know your scale and you know which finger is on which string and what that note is there's a system for naming what the chord name is as right. well yeah that's Does really that... that's interesting um i find in the hammer dulcimer community there are some bits of overlap like for example a shed shape which is a root position chord you know a third on the right and a fourth on the left is the way the easiest way to think about it in hammer dulcimer um d f sharp a d okay so, so you have l4 yeah yeah so um so you know and a lot of people use different triangle shapes i i tend to like the four note chords more when when i can pull them in and thinking in all four notes just to try to keep extending it but the longer i've also played about 43 years um and the longer I play, the more things that sort of just are, it's like bubbling up from the mud. Like one day you just wake up and you have a realization, oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, these different chord shapes and how they relate and easy ways to do one, four, five that people can really grab onto. Yeah. But it is interesting because, for example, um, I didn't have a good, so root position is that um, shed. First inversion, which is thirds in both hands, F sharp, A, D, F sharp. Uh, it's sort of a parallelogram, but parallelogram shape doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. So we call it flag just because it's sort of like, you know, sort of like a, you know, slightly skewed flag, but it's flag is so much easier than parallelogram. And then <laughs> it was great. I have a, a, I had a student who was, um, uh, she had lots of family in Nevada. And so when we were doing the second inversion somebody i had heard they were like oh it's the upside down backwards sail thingy and i was just like there's got to be a better way than that <laughs> like oh it's nevada and i was like oh it's nevada and so yeah you know the longer side on the right and the shorter side on the left so it's the opposite of the shed it's like you take it in shed and flipped it and reversed it it's right yeah. Yeah. right so it, that was beautiful so i call it nevada but not everybody not everybody does so when i go to workshops when i'm teaching workshops i always have to, you know, uh, give everybody the caveat that I call it this, somebody else might call it that one isn't right, one is wrong, we're just finding ways to describe it because it's not a necessarily a common language, we're all just trying to reach the same end goal there. Right. So, yeah. There's a, we also have a, a, a word because we are tuned, the outside strings are the same note name, though they're an octave apart. Um, if you have an L-shaped chord that's three three five, you can also have an L-shaped, a reversed L-shaped chord, <clears throat> which is five three three, mm. right? And that's the same thing with the slants. So we say slant or reverse slant, mm -hmm. extended slant or reverse extended slant, right. and um, some are easier to reach for some people's hands than yes. others, and mm. it depends on the size of your instrument. So. Here's a thing among mountain dulcimer players. In recent years, we've been given um, fretboards that are up to five or six inches shorter. Hmm. Uh, I learned on a 29 and a quarter inch VSL, that's from the nut to the bridge, the vibrating string length. Hmm. That was what I got in 1979 when I started playing. I now have two instruments um, that are a 25 inch vsl wow. and in between i went down to a 28 inch folk craft beautiful thing that i have and um that 25 inch one it increased my ability so much wow. my agility my my i could i could finally do a c chord uh -huh. three four six oh wow. my god that was hard to reach it was impossible to reach if it was reversed mm -hmm. so what about innovations in hammer dulcimer construction that have uh, increased your ability to play? Uh, you know, I'm not, a lot of people have the dulcifer fortes right now. I don't have one. The extended range seems amazing. And I could be wrong here, but from what I think I understand, you can have the same notes going up both sides of the extended range. So you have your bass bridge, you have your treble bridge, but you have extra bridges. I have a small extra bridge on mine, which is great. I've sort of tuned it a different way than the than my builder, Nick Blanton, intended. Um, but uh, but I love having the extended range, getting that low D. And for me, I'm a right hand lead player. 
I like having my right, my extended notes on the right hand, but then other players who are left hand lead, this is a nice thing is you can have it on one side or the other. It's not, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be on one side. And from what I understand, there um, Ray at um, Dusty Strings and Nick and Sam were all talking about ways to change the bracing. And I love that. I don't know how it is with lap dulcimer players, but um, when I was growing up, my dad made my instruments. And um, when he was beginning to make instruments and asking, like asking other builders, can I study what you've done? Can I come basically sort of apprentice with you a little bit? And they said no, because they were very, um, it's not territorial, what do you call it? Proprietary. Um, proprietary, yeah, they were very proprietary. And, you know, my dad was just going to do it for a hobby. He was never going to, you know, suddenly set up shop and start cranking out hammer dulcimers. But um, but he did. The first hammer dulcimer we had was a West Virginia single bridge hammer dulcimer, no bass strings at all, very limited range. So um, and none of the, you know, no marked courses or anything. And then I went up to he bought me. No, actually, uh, he was making the single bridge hammer dulcimers and then he applied to the Smithsonian because he found out they had the hammer dulcimer plans there and uh, they were terrible. Uh, and then I think <laughs> he applied, he's like, this will never hold. Then he applied again because he found out there were more than one plan and he did get a good set of plans. And um, he made, he did make my first double bridge to hammer dulcimer. So um, tone is so much better. Um, it really, I think it's beautiful that depending on what you like, and I know this is the same with any instrument, you know, if you like, if you're going to be playing a lot of slow lyrical music, you can get um, higher sustain and very rich tone. Um, but if you want to be playing more fast music, you can get something that has a quicker sustain and a little bit of a drier sound. So it's fascinating to me to hear the differences, even regionally, uh, when I was in uh, Texas at the Glen Rose Festival, um, the David Lindsay dulcimers are pretty much what everyone plays. And I don't know if it's called the Texas Grand. I think that's what it's called. But it is literally, and it's, it has a wooden top. It's old school like that. That's the way they used to have a hinge top. And no case because the dulcimer and its wooden top, it, that's the case. And it's 50 pounds. <laughs> and the string spacing is further. And I mean, if you're playing a contra dance, you don't need to be miked because it is amazing the voice on that thing is amazing but it has a very different timbre um, than what i play and i the people playing those instruments have a completely different style which is beautiful for what they're doing and wonderful so it's fascinating to me how uh, you know depending what you want to play how you want to play it um the blanton that i that i bought the beautiful um forte i first had a, a a decreased range a compact dulcimer i played karen's um we were in DC playing some dances and Paul Ortz played along with us and our kids hung out with Karen and had a great time. And um, I played Karen's dulcimer and started out with a compact, but then I needed a bigger voice, needed a more architectural sound. And so the um, the Forte, the Blanton Forte was the right dulcimer for me. The pedal's nice, you know, being able to change the timbre. The hammers are great because you can flip over and have you know wood on one side you can have compacted leather which just takes a little bit of the edge off you can have like more of a suede which really takes more of the overtones you can do hand damping so between all of those things you can really change the the tone and timbre of your instrument quite a bit uh, so it's really fascinating it's it really uh brings home to me how much the hammer dulcimer is percussion Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I, when I was in fifth grade, I'd been playing dulcimer for a couple of years and they tested us for band instruments. And, you know, the, the guy's just kind of like, you know, he's been giving kids like rhythm and pitch drills. And I come in and he gives me some little rhythm thing and I'm like then I give it back. And he's like and he gives me something much harder, you know, and he he, he got very excited. <laughs> <laughs> And I said to my mom, hi, that's my son walking through there. Uh, so I said to my mom, uh, I said, guess what? I'm going to play percussion. I'm, I'm going to be a drummer. And she said, no, you're not. <laughs> so all she knew was like my my next door neighbor, you know, with his drum pad, uh, you know, uh, you know, practicing in his room and driving everybody crazy. So she she squashed that, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, God love her. But I was a percussionist anyway. Yes. Uh, yes, you yeah. are a percussionist. Totally. Have a great well, time with it. 
my goodness, time goes by. It's yeah. it's 929. Wow. I know, I know. Um, we like to keep these short so that people can watch the replay some other time, but oh my goodness, we can we can have conversations like this forever. Um and it's one of the things that I'm loving about the internet is how we are able to connect with people, you know, San Francisco Bay Area to Ohio, you know. Um it's really fantastic. So, right. hey folks, Tina Bergman's going to be teaching and playing at Dulce Moon in January. You want to be there. You just want to be there. And uh, we are doing a fundraising campaign right, right now. If you go to dulcemoon.com, um, hit on the donate button. That doesn't mean you have to donate. It just takes you to the donate page and you can decide if you want to kick in something. Every little dollar counts right now. We're getting the website up to snuff. We're trying to make sure we have all the financial security in place so that any uh, transactions you make are completely secure. Um, all of that stuff and pretty, pretty graphics too. They're really pretty graphics. I love it. Yeah. So if you'll take a look at that sometime in the next week or so, we've gotten uh, over 20% so far of our $5,000 goal. We have uh, just over a thousand has been raised from uh, some about, oh, a dozen generous donors. So that's exciting. And Tina, thank you so much for your time this morning. I'm really glad it worked out. Me too, DJ. Thank you. And I'm really looking forward to the festival and all of the female fellowship that, yes. uh, that uh, will, will be in, in said festival. Sisterhood. Yeah, totally. It is. A sisterhood. <laughs> I love it. I'm just so grateful for that. Okay, thanks. Talk to you all soon, folks. This will be available for replay, so share it with your friends. Bye-bye.